annual uh, spring symposium for the Center on Rights Development. My name is Claude Stray. I'm a professor here at the Borgall School and the director of the Human Rights Degree Program as well as uh, Ford. Um, we're very fortunate this afternoon uh, to have uh, one part of a wonderful team. Uh, I think of them as a team uh, now having met them and talked to them and seen the work that they've done together for many uh, years. Um, uh, Elian uh, Chantel Parpoledo uh, served as Peru's Primera Dama, the First Lady from 2001 to 2006, supporting her husband Alejandro Toledo's agenda through the creation of a National Commission for the Andean, Amazonian, and Afro-Peruvian Peoples. This broad-based commission, made up of representatives of numerous ethnic populations, Secretary of States, uh, members of Congress and academics, promoted the first official meetings at the national level to discuss grievances, claims, and proposals to improve the participation and empowerment of indigenous peoples. Working to renew the democratic process of Peru. Prior to that, she worked with the World Bank, specializing in the measurement of the social impact of development programs on poor beneficiaries in Africa and Latin America. After 2006, she returned to Stanford University, from where she graduated and taught at the Department of Anthropology until 2009. I understand this is where they two met, or the romance developed, they got married, and I think that uh, Eliana had no idea what her future was in store for her. <laughs> At that point, um, she specialized in Andean ethno history, the Inca state, indigenous rebellions and resistance, as well as modern indigenous peoples of South and Central America and their claims for participation in politics in today's democracies. She is currently, and since 2010, director for projects and policies of social inclusion at the Global Center for Democratic or for Continuing Development and Democracy, the CGDD, based in Lima, Peru. From 2012 to 2014, she was a visiting scholar at Stanford University, where she conducted research for her latest publication, and Peru Indivisible. I won't try to do the rest because I will hurt the ears of Spanish speakers in the audience. Uh, which has been published by Editorial uh, Planeta in Peru in November of 2014. Uh, please, a warm welcome to Elaine Carpenter. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Claude Dettre, for such a generous presentation. And just by the way, we met in 75, when I was a very young student. And uh, no, I didn't know what would, what would happen and what his destination, his destiny would be. So uh, this was, was all very ingenious, but we get there. So I also want to thank all of you for coming, for being interested in this subject. Uh, I want to congratulate the university for starting a new Latin American center. I think that's absolutely great. We're very thrilled about it. And congratulate, I can't see them, uh, but Oliver and Aaron, if other you are over there, okay, great. Uh, for having the luck and the privilege of starting this. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what's gonna um, interesting interest us. Please, if at any point you don't understand me or you don't understand what I'm talking about, please stop me. Um, we'll have a Q&A, which will be uh, pretty much 30 minutes, 45 minutes, so we can do there. Um, the full title, which is not a good translation, El Peru Invisible, Invisible Peru, yes, but we'll see why it is invisible, uh, in search of the indigenous rights in times of democracy and globalization. That's the title we've chosen for it, although it's a little bit long. Um, and this is the product of many years of work with, directly with indigenous peoples, the communities, living with them, I learned one language, which is Quechua, the majority 
language, but it's about more than 60 languages spoken in Peru. Um, and also, it reflects very much on the experience we had within this commission, which Peru started for the first time, which is a multidisciplinary commission which we created, which was autonomous and had the rank of the Ministry of the of, um, Ministerio for the indigenous people to be able to have access through their representatives to the government. So let's see if this works. Yes. Um, the, the people that you see here, we've made them kind of a silhouette, so they are like if they didn't exist, but yet they're so important and there's so many of them. We, we, we have used the three very different regions of Peru, which is the coast here, with its symbol, the spotless shell. Uh, we've used the Andean woman, and she's very well connected, although she's very high in the Andes and the Amazon um, people also are represented. So they are in silhouette, they are in dark, and this is correspondence to the title. Um, the methodology that we have used is direct interviews with leaders that we have worked with, so it's, we haven't put their name in the book, um, just to protect them, to tell you the truth. Uh, so none of the people who have been interviewed, whether it's indigenous peoples or business people, the business community, or the academicians, none of them have been uh, put with their name, although we know it and we can give it to anybody who wants it. So some basic working hypothesis. We are working around the concept of democracy and indigenous people, does it go together? Are they interested at all in what's going on? Is going on in government? Um, so, uh, one of the hypotheses, definitely the first one. Okay. Is that there is no viable democracy in the Andean countries without the social, political, and economic participation of indigenous people. That's the very basic one. Um, the second one is that Peru, uh, at least, because this is a 2007 survey, it's not even now, as if it's of CEPAL, or the, East, uh, the Economic Commission of Latin America, um, because we do consider that Peru does not have good surveys because of the methodology they use. 2007, there were 7 million people considered in indigenous in Peru, 25% of the population, as measured by only one indicator. And that's why we say we don't consider it's a very good census, the indicator is the mother language. So whether they speak Quechua at home um, or another indigenous language, then they consider indigenous. Um, we don't think that it is enough. We prefer to talk about a complex index. We think that this has a very, very important impact on how social policy should be conducted in Peru. Um, needless to say, and I'm very sad to be able to, to say this today in 2015, discrimination and, race and racism in Peru is still very much prevalent at all levels. Even if you go into a small store and you are indigenous, you speak like an indigenous, you have some pieces of dressing of indigenous, um, you're not particularly well received. Despite democracy and globalization, I'm sorry, um, I call it the neo-colonialist matrix, as we call it, which is still very present, and in the book we talk about the imagine, lo imaginario, which is, I don't know how we will translate it, but the imaginary uh, of how indigenous people are perceived within the mind of people. Um, and this, of course, there produces direct correlation between this perception, this perception, economic disparities, and a strong stratification of people in general in the society. Um, what do people refer to when they want to protect their rights? They don't go to local legislation, they go directly to the ILO Convention, 169. So, um, most of the Latin American countries have signed this ILO Convention. Peru was one of the first ones to sign it in 93. 
and um, it has not never been properly implemented. The Peruvian Congress has signed the previous consent right for the indigenous people in 2011. So there's a big lap between the moment that Peru accepts the ILO Convention and the time that the Congress really votes on the previous consent law, which is very um, much the focus of conflict. And then here, conflict and violence very present in indigenous territories because their rights are not implemented. So the laws are there, they exist, they exist to be implemented, they have been ratified by the Congress, but they're not implemented. And I let you ask me um, why they're not implemented in the Q&A that, that we'll have later. Okay, let's look at the numbers. So the book has quantitative and qualitative data, and it mixes the two in order to have a better vision of what we're really talking about. The quantitative data is, most of it, is the census that the CEPAL has conducted in Peru with a methodology which is different than, than um, what the Navy Institute of Statistics in Peru conducts. It has used an indicator of if one person in the household speaks a, um, an indigenous language, then the whole household is concerned. They are recording conflicts and reasons for conflicts. Um, We've had very big episodes of conflicts, 2008, 2009, which is called Baguaso, if some of you who really have studied Peru know. We had 2012 in Conga, uh, again, very big fight, very violent, and we've had a lot more recent. Here again, we have the same character who's digging everything, and uh, he says to this family, you are poor. And um, if you sell me your house and your land in Tu Laguna, in your, your lake, uh, you will have some money, tendrás platita, a little bit of money. And then, um, then the indigenous family replies, and when I won't have the money anymore, I won't have my hills, and I won't have my, my lake, and he answers, ignorant. So definitely a great opposition and a great difference um, in the thinking. These are some of the pictures of the, of the violent conflict. I wanted to show it. I'm sorry, this always comes. Um, because they were massive. And they were not just of indigenous people. They were of Mestizo. They were of the whole uh, town and the whole people who live in the region. Um, this is one. Um, I think it's Bagua. And Bagua has, um, I mean, this of course is the way that conflicts are usually dealt with, story the contrary of what should be done, should be able to sit and talk before all this happens. Um, Bagua is, a, is a, a town in the department of Amazonas which happened to uh, have mining and they were totally opposed to a government project. Um, before that, there was a signing in the Congress, the executive at the time um, of the government of Garcia had sent um, some, some loans, some projects to be signed without anybody knowing it, saying that they were sending for licitation, for concessions, uh, almost all of the Amazon region, without anybody knowing it. It was up for grabs and it was, I will show that later. Um, without consulting the civil society or the indigenous people who do benefit from the previous uh, consensus law, it should have been consulted. So when we have episodes like this, it does a lot of harm for the entire society. It brings back the old cliche, well said by the, imagine, the imaginary of how the indigenous people are, that they are primitive, that they don't want modernity, they are against progress, and it polarizes again the, the society uh, at large, Pro provokes confrontation with the, say, the state and other citizens, and creates many different um, conflicts. Um, here is the commission that we try to, sorry, I keep doing this, the commission that we um, put up uh, during the government of my husband, 
and um, many of, of this was very, very long discussion. This is in the Congress, it has anthropologists, um, Congress people. We wanted to produce um, some laws which would be put into the Constitution of Peru. We wanted to change some of the laws in favor of them. And here, of course, is the source of the problem, is extractive industries and enterprises and its contamination of the environment and the fact that um, all the things they really care about that we have seen in their community, which is clean water and a clean way of life, is being taken away from them. Um, today, we, this is the same commission that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Uh, it has been little by little destroyed by the um, two governments that came after us. And it has not been destroyed by law, it has been destroyed simply by removing their budget. So it's a very easy way of doing it. You just take the money away, they have no more budget to function, and then this is it, they don't exist. So it's, a, it's a, what I call the la institucionalidad negada. There is no more institution for them, nobody is there to represent them. And there's nothing they can do about it. So with that, this is something they put up at the anniversary of Bagwas. Without dialogue and without consulting, there is no inclusion. So instead of promoting all this fighting, you know, these conflicts with the army, let's promote consensus to prevent uh, social conflict. And that's the idea. But the consensus has to be intercultural. It cannot be just one way. It has to be at least a two-way street. So this is the data um, which has been elaborated by the ombuds, ombudsman, so um, Defensoria del Pueblo. And we can see here what is um, what they most complain about. What they most complain about is the ritual educación. It's very interesting that they do consider that this, this is the most important thing for them. Uh, the second thing, of course, is here. And it's the right to the land and territory. I'm not sure about the statistics that the uh, ombudsman is taking, because I'm not sure that the mental categories that the indigenous have do correspond with the ones of the Defensoria. It's a very complex story. When you use another language, your mental categories are different than the, than the uh, Western system. So I'm not sure that what they have here is completely correct. But pretty much I'm sure that they absolutely want bilingual intercultural education and that the right to their land and their territory are pretty much a um, priority, as I'm sure the right to have medical attention, proper medical attention, uh, is also very important to them. Now let's say that now the Ministry of Health uh, has done a lot of work trying to combine intercultural health with the medicine man, with the curandero, and with modern medicine. Uh, that's very interesting work that they've been very successful in doing. We can talk also about it if you want after. Um, this is the, um, the type of and the percent of conflicts that we have mostly in the communities. Um, I will talk about this, def this definition here of communities, campesinos and nativas. Uh, this is also based on the data of Defensoria del Pueblo, so we can see here this very large chunk here is um, socioambiental, so it's based on the environment. Most of the fighting is because of the environment, because of the pollution of the water, which is what they drink, what they live on, and what they use for agriculture. And then the second one would be um, would be the, 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 the discrimination that they have on the community. Now all this, you, and you can see the other ones here, this is probably, this is what they have on the data, but that's the reason I'm saying I'm not very sure about their data. They cannot be 0%. So they do, the, they, have, they have the advantage of at least picking up some data, but I'm not sure it's correct in, in the exact numbers. Um, why do we use so many ter terminology in Peru about we have comunidades campesinas, comunidades nativas, comunidades indígenas, uh, uh, comunidades originarias? 
Um, Peru is one of the very few countries that have such a huge confusion, both in the text of the constitution and both in the legal uh, system. Because, um, and, and this, these are all euphemism. It's, I think, in order not to say we're talking about Indians, because Indians is become a forbidden word, so we are using everything else. And starting um, the period of Velasco, which was the military government in 68, which did produce the agrarian, the land revolution, and gave it to the campesino, uh, he decided, and he said a very famous sentence, he said, Patron ya no comerá de tu sudor. And Patron, the, the boss, at that time it was an asentado, of the hacienda, will not eat anymore from the, the sweat of your, of your body. Um, and then he gave the land, distributed to the campesinos. He decided that the word Indian was not to be used anymore. It would be replaced by campesinos. And now, in order for, for, to avoid the previous consult, um, we, there is a big fight at the level of the, um, of the extractive industry to not call anybody indigenous. They don't have to consult anymore. Okay, I told you there was going to be a, a map, and this is the map of what is allowed to be given in concession in Peru to uh, bid to large companies, and they definitely, uh, you can see what's happening in the indigenous Amazon. This is the whole Amazon region. This is the coast also, and this is the Andean one. So it's uh, also let me talk about something which is very incredible, because you have regions like Ancash. Ancash is one of the most, we'll look at this, most of productive region in Mali. Um, we have a new Minister of Culture, Ministerio de Cultura, who is in charge of elaborating the databases of who is indigenous and who is not. So you can see this whole region has no indigenous and has no concessions. How could it be? This is the Andean one, the Andean region. And it is simply because the government, through its Ministry of Culture, has decided that this whole region, this whole Andean region here, who is made out of campesinos, farmers, is not indigenous. So this whole fighting, which is a fighting also for words and for laws, uh, is in fact giving place to, to, to some very interesting things. These have not, don't have to be consulted. The government can actually do whatever it wants in this region. And this is the richest region there is, and I will talk about it. Um, now, this is another one. This is, um, this is another map of conflict. The zone, the zone in red, of course, you can tell is the one where there's the most conflict, and it's the highlands, it's the Andean highlands, where we have most of the conflicts and the fight. So if you know Peru well enough, you can tell of the departments, etc. Um, and it continues all the way here. The Puno, this is Bolivia here, uh, and Cusco is not here, because somehow it couldn't fit into the slide. But you can tell, and this changes constantly. This is also in red. So the map of the conflict is most of the country would be considered in crisis. Okay, so in order to solve some of these problems, it occurred to the state um, that we would have some royalties for the indigenous communities who had problems with the extractive industry. And these royalties, um, how are we doing with time? Uh, <laughs> Or so. Okay, um, so these royalties are to be distributed to the communities who are affected by the extractive industry. You can see here the percent. Uh, these are the beneficiaries, this is the percent which is dedicated, and this is how you should use these royalties. So it's very well described in the book. Um, the government decided that these royalties should be given to the most affected communities as an indemnization. It is not given for the purpose of development, it's 
given for the purpose of like an indemnization. If you have to move a whole community, if the water is being damaged or contaminated, if it has too much uh, mercury, um, and mercury, and the children get into their lungs and their blood, so you get these percent, but it doesn't go directly to the community. It goes to the what you call the um, the government. Local government, thank you, Austin. Local government and municipality and so on, and it's disaggregated uh, until um, until you get to the smallest level of the mayors. And the mayors decide pretty much what they want to do with it, and the problem is that there is no training for them. There hasn't been any training to decide. Um, just to give you some ideas of how the amounts have been transferred and how they have raised. So Peru has had a buoyant economy, and you can see what happened since 96 all the way to 2012. Um, it's uh, millions of soles in this period, so you pretty much have this to this to um, these 29 billion soles. You pretty much should divide it by three in order to know what the, what the toll is between this period. What we have now, after 2012, is a huge decrease. Between 2012 and 2030, there's been minus 37% of these royalties. And if we go to 2014, we probably have 50% less distributed in uh, the regions. So that's a very, very big problem, having had money. Having had an extraordinary economy, race, and not do anything with it. And now that we have a problem in our growth of the economy, what, what, what shall be done? So here is the, uh, we've had it by region, and it's very important to show how it goes. It's extreme, it promotes disparities in between the regions. Amkash is the one I showed you. Um, which is not considered indigenous, it is pretty much, uh, receives most of the money. For those of you who know Arequipa, Cajamarca, and so on, and then there are some regions who get almost nothing. Um, Madre de Dios is a place where there is a lot of gold, but it's always structured in an informal way. So they get almost nothing. So very unfair, very unjust distribution of the royalties of this exploitation. Um, these are the different um, aspects of who, between um, who are the, con the actors in the conflict, the stakeholders of all these conflicts, and then um, here we have by by the type of social, of environmental uh, conflict, and we can see that the one that brings, sorry, the one that brings most of the problem is mining, <coughs> and also hydro, hydrocarburos. Um, but I don't. Know. Okay. Um, so here, most of the problem is that all the money that has been distributed, which has not gone directly to the communities has been used by the governors in a way that um, it's basic infrastructure, but it's basic infrastructure that does not lead to um, development at all. And we have another problem of execution of the total amount which is given. This is what, um, this is what has been distributed and even less has been used. So there's a problem of um, definitely using of the money. Um, <laughs> this is um, an indigenous person that has uh, given to us in order to be a little bit optimistic about what's going on and not be so pessimis pessimistic. Uh, the only thing that's curious is that he's put an eagle instead of a condor, so we have a lot of work to do with responsibility to fight against hunger, contamination of the planet, and giving happiness to human beings. And this is, all, again, where such a huge difference emerges between getting the money, making a hole, and getting out, without paying too much taxes.
paying as less as you, as you can. The vision of the indigenous people, of course, is absolutely very, very different. They have created their own ideology, their own philosophy, which is called Alien Kausai, the good living. The concept of Alien Kausai, we can talk about it with your question, is in the Bolivian constitution, very curiously, in all the languages, and it sort of opposes um, the type of life of the West. So they've constructed their own. And I will stop here just to receive your your feedback, your questions, if you want me to elaborate a little bit more about what's in the book. And uh, thank you very much. concessions would usually depending on the type of resource for a period of 30 years and depending of, of how much gas and oil there is and gold etc. What is the interest? Uh, first of all, I would say the official version and then, and then there is the non-official version and I have to be very careful because our council is here, our general council of Peru is here, so I have to be very careful what I'm saying and the informal version of it. <laughs> it's just a joke. Eh? <laughs> the first thing is to, so they make, of course, a lot of benefit on this, of course. So there is a lot of money to be made for these corporations. The advantage of the state is so that part of the demand for oil and gas is provided for, so we don't have to import. And in fact, the exploration in Madre de Dios and Gas de Camisea, I don't know if you heard of that project, the Peru found that it has reserves of gas for a period of 120 years. This is extremely important because it has allowed Peru to conduct um, to an energetic revolution in the sense that a lot of the um, of the oil that was needed for the for certain type of industries has been now changed to gas. So it's extremely important. The taxis, for instance, now um, the same thing has happened in Peru that happened in Brazil. They changed their engine and they have they work with gas instead of working with oil, and their revenues at the end of the day is much bigger. So it has had a lot of um, interest for Peru. Um, the one thing that is a great problem is that the regulation to protect the land and the indigenous people, because you can see, I will highlight it again because it's very, uh, it's so obvious, this whole region here which belongs uh, to indigenous people of the Amazon is given up for, for grabs, literally, and then the coast. So even if the regulation exists to protect the land and to protect um, the water and, and the resources, it's not implemented. So it's really a problem of implementation. Um, the land and the water particularly is, is uh, polluted, nothing is given back. And as you can see, these royalties which are transferred from the central government to the, the regions and to the municipalities doesn't go back to the indigenous community at all. So there is a great problem of distribution. There is a great problem of throwing again the indigenous people back where they don't belong. And this is a process that's been happening for 500 years now since colonial times. When the, the, um, the Spaniards came to Peru uh, basically for a very crude region, it's minerals. 
gold. And they wanted to pay their debts, basically their war debts was debt. And they pretty much uh, got a lot of gold out of it. But in order to do it, each time it was to keep the indigenous people out of their communities and to keep, to keep them further away from the fertile agricultural land. And it seems that this is going on endlessly, because we, we are not able to diversify our economy. So Peru is endlessly uh, working with raw material, extraction of raw material, extracting the raw material. Now the land is given in concession for periods of 30 to 40 to 50 years. It's constantly the same, the same process. We're not able to be creative enough. So the book contains a series of recommendations, which is so specific that it's ministry by ministry. What one, and also the work that should be multi-sectorial in order to try to coordinate this and to diversify the economy. Um, so this is what um, the rest that I'm not supposed to say because our Consul General is, is here as more related to corruption issues, which, yes, <laughs> uh, millions of dollars are being given. And I will again highlight Ankash, because Ankash, and very curiously the region where my husband comes from, it's the richest in minerals and in gold. It's also the one that gets part of these royalties, the greatest part of it. There is one town in particular which receives, how much would they receive? 15? 350 million. Solis, solis. It's a little town. <laughs> of course, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to spend it, so they suddenly you see a huge municipality, extremely luxurious, standing up like a white elephant. And that's what their development ID consists of. This we have not managed yet about this. So we are planning, we are planning in both of our books a fund, a fund which will go directly to the indigenous communities. It will have a board, which would be multi-sectorial, and it will go directly for the use and the benefit of the communities. The community, of course, prior there will be also, um, there will be training, would decide what their development plan, uh, priorities are. But they would decide. They would not be sent from Lima on their head, not pushed to them. This is both of us in our respective books uh, have a proposal. Mr. President, your phone's always ringing. Claude, you do this so well. Let's go for so, any other questions? Uh, oh, I have to pick a postdoc. My favorite postdoc. Oh, One question is about there's sort of this tension, right, between the rights that that indigenous communities and their and their cultural practices urge them to pursue and seek. Um, and on the other hand, the rights that they invoke to claim those 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 rights or the laws that they invoke, like you said, involve this international convention or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yep. Right? And so where do you see what's the source of that tension? Is it um, that the idea of citizenship in Peru is still so exclusive that those rights are not available for them to claim? Or does it have something to do with the ways that they mobilize um, among them, that community, indigenous communities mobilize, mobilize among themselves and make those claims on the state? It's a, it's a, very, um, it's a very good question and it's a very complex very many, many uh, tiers and layers. That's why she's a postdoc. That's why she's a postdoc. <laughs> so the concept of citizenship and equal citizenship, which is the one we are asking in the world, do the indigenous people have really access to that in a modern society? So the, you'll hear this afternoon that the title of my husband's book is Shared Society. But are they part of this shared society? Do they share anything at all? What is the concept of citizenship? So I, I may want, I will remind uh, all of us that democracy in Peru is a brand new concept. Uh, it's not like it has been many generations who've lived in it. We have had 
continued democracy now since the year 2001, continued, non-interrupted, and before we had some periods of democracy with um, President Belaunde, but interrupted, who is literally taken out of palace in his pajamas uh, and sent to the US um, by the military government who did the land uh, reform. But so it's a very, very young concept, and people know that democracy gives them the right to complain and to ask for their rights without the tanks being in the streets. And they know it does not necessarily happen. But they don't have really the idea of, of what does it mean to be a citizen, a full right citizen. And they don't because they're not taught what this is all about at school. So we have, um, and I can definitely, for this I have a very clear answer. Um, there is no equal citizenship in Peru, and the indigenous people uh, definitely are not part of this democracy. They are not considered part of this society. And it is so true that if you go um, in internet, you, will, you can see the declaration of a president that follows my husband government right after us, where we had this commission that had the rank of the ministry. And he, when he wanted to list precisely to do those delicitations, these concessions, and the indigenous people rose in Bagua, uh, and they were accompanied by the mestizos and by the, the other people. The whole town stood up, and the army went, and they were dead people. So then this president stands up and publicly says to the press, but who are those people? There's less than 300,000 of them. Do they have the right to stop progress and development? They are second citizen, they are second class citizen. Who the hell do they think they are? Literally, textually, you can see it. Uh, afterwards, during the anniversary of the first 100 years of Machu Picchu, same president, went on and said, yes, we have a population that still believes that the walls are gods, and that the wind is a spirit and brings um, spiritual ID to us. They are primitive. They don't have the right to stop the entire society to develop. So if we have people from the government, if we have an elected president, who says that publicly to the press, how the hell are they gonna feel? <laughs> so the, that's why it, my book starts with the perception and the imagination that people have of how the indigenous people are. And when they come out in the press, they would come out with their face tattooed, and it's true that they use body tattoo all over. And then when they go to conflict and to fight, and before, many years ago, it was against themselves, one, uh, one group against the other in, in the jungle. They were using tattoos of a certain color, which is for war, and there's another type, the red, which, which is for good reception and for feast, for fiestas, etc. But the press reproduces those people with the usual cliché, oh, they still use tattoos, as if we don't use tattoos. So it's, it's this constant, this constant going back to the idea of the primitive, of no, you are a second class citizen, you don't have rights here. It hasn't changed, so we're talking about five centuries now. Yeah. What about Yes, um, I, I, I find this fascinating, especially uh, the contrast between sort of within the country of the indigenous forces and Western. Um, and you talked about a lot about the social and environmental issues around the mining, et cetera. And I'd like to raise another one that's a little bit more long term, uh, and that is related to climate change, because I know in Peru, most of the water that comes for the coast, which is very dry, comes from the mountains. And the recognition that things are significantly changing, is there anything you can talk about in terms of what's happening with the glacier, the sources of water, and how that may so that's of course a huge issue, right? huge. Um, the first thing that we see is the melting of the ice on the high peaks 
So what the indigenous people considered the, the Apus, which are the spiritual forces of the high mountains, there's a, there is, and again in, in Huascaran, in his region, as the third highest mountain in Latin America, it's called El Huascaran, the water is going down. It's disappearing, it's melting away. So for a moment, we're gonna have a lot of water, but it's out of this yellow, ice melting. One thing, because it is such an old uh, civilization, the management of the water, of the dams, and of the preservation of, of potable water was done much better thousands of years ago than it is done today. So the, it was preserved, it was put in dams, in reservation, they, they were preserving food and water. Now nothing is done anymore. So there was um, a project to pass most of the waters in the Amazon region again. To pass some of the, to make a project that would pass the water from the Amazon region to the coast, which is a desert, a complete desert. Um, it has not been done, and uh, we might go get a situation where we are starting to lack water all over, all over. And um, the coast will have, what will continue to be a coast, will not be able to produce food. Peru should be a niche for the world. And this is for the global world of producing food and very special food, types of food which are not very well known. Some of it you can find in Whole Foods under the fair trade uh, project. But there is so much more. And recently quinoa has been discovered by the West. Uh, quinoa has been known for, by the indigenous people for thousands of years, has been domesticated and eaten and consumed. So, yes, it's a huge problem. We are losing water, we are losing the technology that was used thousands of years ago and very well managed. And we don't have projects that will provide yet for the preservation of the water that we are losing now. Plus, the climate is completely disturbed in the entire country. And we are now uh, going through a Nino uh, event, which is very, very serious. So it's raining, it's, um, we have uh, Waikos everywhere. Uh, Waiko? Hmm? Avalanche. 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 Hmm? Avalanche. Erosion erosion of lands everywhere and cannot produce crops on time. Uh, the peasants are the most affected, as you very well said. We can anticipate by the, one, by the ones who do the forecast of this losing of, of water, we can anticipate that since they do the type of agriculture which is by gravedad, by gravity, we can anticipate that pretty soon um, they will be the most affected and there will be even more migration to the urban areas. And we will lose more technology, more farming, more produce, and uh, there will be more poverty related to ethnicity and to being a farmer. I don't even have to look at the numbers for that, I know that's what's gonna happen, because we can see it today. or elaborate upon how the tension that you've described between the so-called non-indigenous political forces within political and economic forces within Peru and the indigenous uh, peoples within Peru are affected by political and economic forces that are outside of Peru, such as by multinational corporations and other state governments such as the United States or China. Yeah. I wish I would have to talk about them. <laughs> so, um, You've probably, I don't know, you've probably had already that discussion in other forums. 
and the uh, president together will talk about this. I hope he will talk about this um, this afternoon. And then again, I will ask our consul general to not listen to what I'm going to say. <laughs> and not repeat it. <laughs> uh, Peru is an extremely segmented uh, society, not only economically, also ethnically. And people are distinguished by the color, where they come from, where they live, and how they speak Spanish. That affects me too, because Spanish is not my mother tongue. So we're all affected by this, and we're all not equal citizens, because we speak differently. So it's a very old neo-colonial matrix and feeling to differentiate people by their origin. In this case, it's an ethnic origin. Um, we have most of the majority of the population of Peru is mestizo, so it has a component of indigenous in them. And we have probably 3% of the population who is who are descendants of the Spaniards or of Europeans of different kinds. And they literally manipulate, handle all the economy in all sectors. Now, these concessions, as I've, as I've said before, are, of course, um, mixed. They are made out of Peruvian business people and U.S., Chinese, etc. And it's true that China has a great, great interest in South America as well as in Africa, and only and solely because of the mining extraction. There's a lot of Chinese interests involved, also U.S., also Canadian, also Australian. I will say in some cases, probably in the case of Australia, there is more consideration about the community life than there is by the Peruvian business people. And it's very interesting, it's also very paradoxical, but maybe because in Australia you have to comply. In Peru nobody obliges you to comply, even if the law is there. So they are more sensitive about this case than the Peruvians themselves. The Chinese is a very different and complex situation because they are not interested, they are not interested at all in the social welfare of the workers and in anything that could be happening to help Peru's economy. Normally, out of this um, canon, this um, canon irregalias, these uh, royalties which are distributed, the enterprises are supposed to be at least constructing a small school, at least a piece of road, and at least a health post, which is nothing, it's peanuts for their pockets. And they very often, the book contains a lot of interviews on, on the uh, enter enterprise, the business community. And they say, and I think they are right in what they say, it is not our role to provide education and health for the campesinos, where is the state? The state does not reach, the state does not get there. So it's true, why should they bear with, with all the welfare project? It is not their role. I agree with that. But at least they should, they should do something. In the case of the Chinese, not interested at all in anything of that. If it's Canadian, Australian, it's better. The Peruvians, they will do it because they have to. It's kind of a brand. Okay, we have to show ourselves now a nice side. We have to look good. So we'll build a little school, and we'll build a little posta medica and a piece of road so that the farmer can bring their produce to the main uh, road. So it's, that is pretty much the situation that, that we have in, in here. Thank you. Yeah. So as you, if you ask it, I'm sure she'll be even more honest with you privately. <laughs> I had a feeling there might be a public so, forum uh, problem. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. Ali? Oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, you mentioned the need uh, for Peru to diversify its economy away from extractive industries, uh, particularly in indigenous areas. What do you think some of the possibilities could be uh, for economic activity in indigenous areas? like outside of copper and petroleum. Um, how can Peru continue to grow economically while protecting its indigenous communities from these extractive industries? Yeah, that's, that's another key issue here. Um, how we think they could be doing agro-industry. 
definitely food. I think food is a very big issue. They're very good at producing it. And as I, as I have said just before, we're making a joke about our own foods, but it is true, they are products which nobody knows about them or their merits. And I think pretty soon we're going to go into a big uh, food security crisis plus water crisis, and the farmers could definitely uh, produce small um, micro and small businesses. They'd be good at this too. They are used to work in a communal fashion and manner. They just need to be trained to do that. Is it going to replace the huge amounts that mining and oil and, and, and gas is producing? Probably not in one shot. Probably not in one shot. So we also have um, ecotourism which could bring a lot of money and they could be the guides and they could show their communities and the regions, uh, they know their history, they know their technology. It could be a very good option also. They could be lodges, they could be busy with tourism worldwide and then we could help the state at the first, uh, first moment should help them of course to connect with other businesses overseas and to have the connection through internet. That's another one that could help a lot. Um, there's many, many other things. Handcraft is extremely, I know Mexico makes a lot of money out of handcraft. Peru is one of the most beautiful handcraft there is. That is another situation. Um, so there's a lot of avenues that we could consider. Are we going to be able to do once for all away with extractive industry? I doubt. The amounts could be reduced. We could do something else with it. We could elaborate it, like not exporting it gold. And the dividends could be better distributed so that we really have a shared society. And that the, about the distribution issue, what really worried me is that the golden years that we had, that was everything before 2013, where there was so much money available, have not been used properly because the governors didn't know how to use it, because the farmers have not received anything. Um, and now that the economy is slowing down and we have 50% less of these royalties to distribute, uh, I'm, I'm very worried about that. Very worried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and please join me thanking. Yes.